What we could not do for ourselves, God has done for us. He has put us into Christ. Let me remind you of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. I think this is one of the best verses of the whole New Testament. Ye are in Christ. How? Of him, that is, of God, are ye in Christ. Praise God! It's not left to us either to devise a way of entry or to work it out. We need not plan how to get in. God has planned it. And he has not only planned it, but he's also performed it. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus. We are in. Therefore we need not try to get in. It's a divine act, and it is accomplished. When the Lord Jesus was on the cross, all of us died, not individually, for we've not yet been born, but being in him, we died in him. One died for all, therefore all died. When he was crucified, all of us were crucified. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus. The Lord God himself has put us in Christ, and in his dealing with Christ, God has dealt with the whole race. Our destiny is bound up with his. What he has gone through, we have gone through. For to be in Christ is to have been identified with him in both his death and resurrection. He was crucified. Then what about us? Must we ask God to crucify us? Never. When Christ was crucified, we were crucified. And his crucifixion is past, therefore ours cannot be future. I challenge you to find one text in the New Testament telling us that our crucifixion is in the future. All references to it are in the Greek aorist, which is the once for all tense, the eternally past tense. And just as no man could ever commit suicide by crucifixion, for it were a physical impossibility to do so, so also, in spiritual terms, God does not require us to crucify ourselves. We were crucified when he was crucified, for God put us there in him. That we have died in Christ is not merely a doctrinal position, it is an eternal fact. The Lord Jesus, when he died on the cross, shed his blood thus giving his sinless life to atone for our sin and to satisfy the righteousness and holiness of God. To do so was the prerogative of the Son of God alone. No man could have a share in that. The scripture has never told us that we shed our blood with Christ. In his atoning work before God, he acted alone. No other could have a part. But the Lord did not die only to shed his blood. He died that we might die. He died as our representative. In his death he included you and me. We often use the term substitution and identification to describe these two aspects of the death of Christ. Now, many a time the use of the word identification is good, but identification would suggest that the thing begins from our side, that I try to identify myself with the Lord. I agree that the word is true, but it should be used later on. It's better to begin with the fact that the Lord included me in his death. It is the inclusive death of the Lord which puts me in a position to identify myself not that I identify myself in order to be included, it is God's inclusion of me in Christ that matters. It is something God has done. For that reason, those two New Testament words, in Christ, are always very dear to my heart. The death of the Lord Jesus is inclusive. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus is alike inclusive. We have looked at the first chapter of 1 Corinthians to establish the fact that we are in Christ Jesus. 
Now we'll go to the end of the same letter to see something more of what this means. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 and 47, two remarkable names or titles are used of the Lord Jesus. He is spoken of there as the last Adam, and he is spoken of too as the second man. Scripture does not refer to him as the second Adam, but as the last Adam. Nor does it refer to him as the last man, but as the second man. The distinction is to be noted, for it enshrines a truth of great value. As the last Adam, Christ is the sum total of humanity. As the second man, he is head of a new race. So we have here two unions, the one relating to his death and the other to his resurrection. In the first place, his union with the race as the last Adam began historically at Bethlehem and ended at the cross and the tomb. In it, he gathered up into himself all that was in Adam and took it to judgment and death. In the second place, our union with him as the second man begins in resurrection and ends in eternity, which is to say it never ends. For having in his death done away with the first man, in whom God's purpose was frustrated, he rose again as head of a new race of men, in whom that purpose shall be fully realized. When therefore the Lord Jesus was crucified on the cross, he was crucified as the last Adam. All that was in the first Adam was gathered up and done away in him. We were included there. As the last Adam, he wiped out the old race. As the second man, he brings in the new race. It is in his resurrection that he stands forth as the second man. And there too, we are included. For if we have become united with him by the likeness of his death, we shall be also by the likeness of his resurrection. We died in him as the last Adam. We live in him as the second man. The cross is thus the power of God which translates us from Adam to Christ. But to say that all that we need comes to us in Christ by free grace, though true enough, may seem unpractical. How does it work out in practice? How does it become real in our experience? Our crucifixion can never be made effective by will or by effort, but only by accepting what the Lord Jesus did on the cross. Our eyes must be open to see the finished work of Calvary. Some of you, prior to your salvation, may have tried to save yourselves. You read the Bible, prayed, went to church, gave alms. Then one day your eyes were opened and you saw that a full salvation had already been provided for you on the cross. You just accepted that and thanked God and peace and joy flowed into your heart. Now salvation and sanctification are on exactly the same basis. You receive deliverance from sin in the same way as you receive forgiveness of sins. For God's way of deliverance is altogether different from man's way. Man's way is to try to suppress sin by seeking to overcome it. God's way is to remove the sinner. Many Christians mourn over their weakness, thinking that if only they were stronger, all would be well. The idea that because failure to lead a holy life is due to our impotence, something more is therefore demanded of us, leads naturally to this false conception of the way of deliverance. If we are preoccupied with the power of sin, with our inability to meet it, then we naturally conclude that to gain the victory over sin we must have more power. If only I was stronger, we say, I could overcome my violent outbursts of temper. And so we plead with the Lord to strengthen us that we may exercise more self-control. But this is altogether wrong. 